good morning. Hopefully you all got this paper handed out to you. I won't be spending a lot of time, but one of the reasons why I, this was something that I came across back in probably around 2011, 2012. And it's been greatly edited, so as you can see there, I edited it in 2012. But a lot of times, I, if you haven't found out yet, I really do enjoy uh, studying the major and the minor prophets because I find that as I study them, it helps in character development. It also helps to recognize that there are people that went through difficulties and how God dealt with those people. And I think it's very important for us to spend time looking at them. But a lot of times when you get into the major and the minor prophets, you kind of get lost with all the different kings and all the different prophets and where they were and who they were talking to. And that's why I kind of put this together so that I could help me see. And I thought, you know what, I think it's good for the church too to help them be able to see. So what you've got here is the king of the north on the right side and all the way through Israel. And then the kings of Judah, which is the south, that goes all through their kings. And beside each name, I've given you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And there are a few of them that have thumb that are sideways. Kind of reminds me of, I don't know if any of you were Mork and Mindy fans, but it's eh, 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 right? <laughs> All right, so some of them have the thumbs that are on their sides. And each one of them you kind of go through, and it helps to show you how each of those kings was. And this morning I'm going to be spending a little bit of time in the book of Hosea. And you can see him kind of halfway, a little bit more down on the right, Hosea with a star next to his name, because he was speaking to Israel. You also notice that above him you've got Jonah, who was also speaking to Israel, and it makes a lot of sense because when Jonah, I don't know if you know before, but Jonah, one of the reasons why he didn't want to go to Nineveh is because the Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Why in the world would God want to send me to the very people who are actually destroying us? And so Jonah was refusing to go because of that reason. And so each of these does that. But Hosea is speaking at a time where he's speaking to this northern kingdom. And if you remember some of the stuff I've talked with you about in the past is Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. They're saying, guys, here's a model of what we don't want to do. Because this is what happened to them, and God has shared with me that if we do what they did, then we're going to follow suit, and we're going to also be taken into captivity. Now we know, if you don't know, that the southern kingdom of Judah actually was only in their captivity for 70 years and released. But the northern kingdom, what happened to them? They're gone. They were actually assimilated and kind of absorbed into society, and they are gone. But one of the things I want to pick up with you, if you've got your Bibles there, in Hosea, as he is speaking, and so the question in my mind is, okay, Jeremiah and many of these guys are speaking to the southern kingdom, telling them what needed to happen in their lives. And if they did not change, if they didn't have a heart transplant, that something devastating was going to happen. And so when you start looking at this northern kingdom now, Hosea is pre speaking to them. And I'm not going to spend going through all of the chapters, but I'm going to pick little pieces here and there so that we can kind of gain a picture. And Hosea chapter 4 is where I want to start. Hosea is speaking to them in Hosea chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. For the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness, there is no loyalty, and there is no knowledge of God in the land. Wow, what a strong message, huh? Verse 2 says, Swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who live in it languish. Together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea are perishing. Yet let no one contend, and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophets also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you 
for being a priest to me. It's interesting what he's saying here. Not only is this towards the people, but it's saying that even the leaders are responsible for what has happened. And if you remember, Jeremiah, early on, or later on, I should say, went to the temple on the stairs and said that you think by coming into this house that you are safe, and yet you go on committing all these murders. That's in Jeremiah chapter 7. It's interesting here, very first thing, he's saying, man, you're swearing, you're lying, you're murdering, you're stealing, adultery, bloodshed, the land mourns. There is no faithfulness, no loyalty, and no knowledge of God. This was described about the northern kingdom. Then it was described about the southern kingdom. It has been described of the people throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And you and I, as spiritual Israel, are being described here as well. Go to verse 7. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. They change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it, will, and it shall be like people, like priests, I will punish them for their ways. The reality is generation after generation after generation. If you are an Adventist, for instance, and you have a child who's an Adventist, and then that child chooses not to be an Adventist, what is typically going to happen to the child of that child? They're not going to be Adventist. If you continue to perpetuate, that's why Adam and Eve could no longer remain in, in the Garden of Eden because that sin could not be allowed to perpetuate. What it is explaining here is if we allow things to go on, we'll have like the days of Noah. Every heart was evil continually. Is that happening in our world today? It's happening in our world again today. Go to uh, chapter... Well, even in verse 10 as well. They shall eat, but shall not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply. Here's the thing. Playing the whore, you are actually having children, but you're not having children of God. They're perpetuating sin. Because they have forsaken the Lord to devote themselves to whoredom. Now go down to chapter 7, Hosea chapter 7. Verse 14, and this is powerful, listen to this. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. They gash themselves for grain and wine, they rebel against me. So they are what? They are crying. They are weeping. But what are they more concerned about? We're going to find they're more concerned about wealth, prosperity, the world than God, because it says that there is no knowledge of God. So yeah, they're weeping and they're crying, but what's their motive? And we're going to continue to look at that this morning. Chapter 8, go down to verse 4. It says, it continues and says that Israel cries to me, Oh my God, we Israel know you. Israel has spurned the good, the enemy shall pursue him. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but without my knowledge. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. Okay? So they're crying out to God that they know him. Does that sound familiar to a New Testament? Lord, Lord, did we not do these things? And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. The same thing that was happening then it's happening in the time of Christ. It's happening. That's why I've continued to share with you that our focus in our lives is to know Jesus. It's interesting. When you go back to the early, I'm talking about Enoch and such, they were spending their time in, in you know what the knowledge they were increasing in? It was the knowledge of God. And you and I think, well, what, how much knowledge is there? If God is no beginning and no end, how much knowledge is there of God? It's infinite. But yet today, what is our knowledge? Our knowledge is in other things. And it says here that the knowledge of God is limitless. And yet they have no knowledge of God. They're doing all these other things. There in chapter 8, go down to verse 13. 
It says, they offer choice sacrifices. Though they eat flesh, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. You know what that's referring to? That is the captivity that they were in Egypt for 400 to 430 years. That they were in captivity in Egypt. And he says that they offer sacrifice. Jesus is saying, you know what? The reality is, if you're making sacrifice and your heart isn't with me, if your knowledge isn't me, then save the sacrifice because your sacrifice is worthless. Your sacrifice is empty. He says, what I want is a knowledge of me. Then your sacrifice has meaning. Then your sacrifice has meaning. So then it goes on there. Go to chapter 13. Chapter 13, starting with verse 4. So in, and this is what I love. Despite what they were doing, that's why I entitled the sermon, The Grip of Relentless Grace. Because despite that, the Lord says there in chapter 13, verse 4, Yet I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. It was I who fed you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. When I fed them, they were satisfied. They were satisfied, and their heart, whoops, was proud. And then they forgot about me. So the Lord was guiding them all along. He was with them all along, despite the hardships, despite the turmoil, despite the distrust or the unfaithfulness, God was still there, relentless grace. And God was still there for them no matter what. He's the one that fed them. He's the one that led them. And yet they had lost sight of him. They began to look at themselves. They began to weep and cry because they didn't have what they thought they needed. Come on. Is that our world today? We pray for things that we think we need or that we want. But when God reveals to us the things that we do need, we go back to prayer. God is trying to teach them a lesson. Now what happens, it's interesting, if you've got your Bibles there, God calls them to repentance again. Go back to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Come, come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn and, and he will heal us. He has struck down and, and he will bind us up. Verse 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. He desires the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. It's the same for us today. Go to chapter 14 with this idea of repentance. Chapter 14, verses 1 says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and, and return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all guilt. Accept that which is good, and we will offer the fruit of our lips. The reality is, in verse 3, Assyria cannot save us. We will not ride upon horses. We will say no more our God to the work of our hands. If you, the orphan, finds mercy. This is interesting to me, because are we not supposed to be God's children? And yet here it's saying that we're orphans. There are times, and I think that God gets frustrated with us, because he says many times, these are your people. When in reality, it is supposed to be, these are my people. God is saying here that these are orphans. He does not wish us to be that. And so what happens there in Hosea chapter 12, something interesting takes place. In Hosea chapter 12, starting with verse 2. The Lord says this, The Lord has an indictment against Judah, and I will punish Jacob according to his ways, and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb he tried to supplant his brother, and in his manhood he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He met him at Bethel, and there he spoke with him. The Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. 
But as for you, return to your God. Hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. He's trying to share with them, the same as Jeremiah, the same for us today, is that, you know what? We're a stubborn people. And we have, we're set in our ways. And change is not something that many of us enjoy all that much. And here he is saying, you know what? He says, you're just like Jacob, who was trying to supplant his brother. But he recognizes that there is a transformation in Jacob's life, where it says that in his manhood, he strove with God. We know the story, don't we? If you've got your Bibles there, still go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 25. Just look at a few verses here as we kind of remind ourselves of this situation. Genesis chapter 25, we're familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau. Down in verse 29, you've got Jacob stewing up this lentil soup. Chapter 25, verse 29. says that once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff and I, because I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what is use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, Swear it to me first. So he swore to him and sold him his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That must have been some pretty good lentil stew, huh? They give up something that in that time was extremely important. He gave it up for some soup. Well, we end up in the story, we have this story of Jacob and Esau, and there is this bitter strife that happens between the two of them. Even later on, after Jacob leaves, if you remember the story, he ends up getting wives of, of Leah and Rachel. And if you've got your Bibles there, turn to Genesis chapter 27, right there, it's just the next chapter over. In Genesis chapter 27, go down to verse 36. Actually, you can even go back to verse 34 because it's an interesting parallel here. In verse 34, it said, When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter what? Cry. And said to his father, Bless me also, father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times, right? He gets the one before, now he's getting this too. And he took away my birthright, and look, now he has taken away my blessing. Now here's the question. If Hosea is connecting us to this story of this bitter cry, then the reality is that Esau's crying was not for the right motive. He was more worried about what he had lost, but didn't really understand the meaning or the importance of what he had lost. Hosea is trying to share this same thing with the people. Now what's interesting, if you've still got your Bible there, turn to chapter 31. Fast forwarding a little bit in the story, chapter 31 this is where we get into Rachel and Leah. And when he had fled from Esau, it was probably a good 20 years before he came back. But in Genesis chapter 31, starting with verse 4, it says that Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages how many times? Ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. It goes on to say in verse 8, He said, The speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckles. 
And then if he said, the stripes shall be your wages, all the flock bore stripes. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. It's interesting in our lives, as you look at the life of Jacob, and we're going to look a little bit more here in a minute, is the same as the life of what Hosea was preaching to Israel, which is the same thing that I'm preaching to us is that in our spiritual lives, there are times and moments where we are strong. And there are other times where we're not so strong. And we go through this roller coaster spiritual life. And it becomes difficult. And the devil hits us like he did Christ at our weakest points. And causes us to cry out to God. But the question I'm challenging each of us with, is what are we crying out for? And so what happens here, if you've got your Bibles there, go down in there in chapter 31, go down to verse 31. Jacob and, and Laban are having this conversation, and then Jacob, now he's going to the low again. Here he is talking about how strong it is that God has provided for him. Now he's having a conversation with Laban in verse 31. He says, because I was what? Afraid. For I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. But anyone with whom, whom you find your God shall not live. In the presence of your kinfolk, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So there is this constant up and down type of spiritual walk with God. And God needs to intervene sometimes in our lives, doesn't he? And I believe that, and I've shared this with you before, part of our prayer life should be, God, now is a good time. Because there are things in my life that I am not proud of, and I need an intervention. I need you to anoint my eyes so that I can see. And then once you reveal to me and I see, the Bible says that we are to turn from the ways in which we live. And that's what Jacob did many times. But I love what happened. If you've got your Bibles there in Genesis chapter 28. This was the first time God intervened. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. We probably all know the story. Even our children know this story. That Jacob was there and he had a dream. And there in this dream he saw what? A ladder set up from the earth to the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and to your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. You think that in this dream, Jacob was feeling strong. Let me ask you something. I don't know how much of you have studied this. Does anyone here know what the ladder represents? It represents Christ. If you and I could pull back the curtains, we would see angels moving to and from heaven on our behalf. And he's trying to show to Jacob, to teach Jacob, that throughout his life, even though he may not have recognized it, that God had been sending angels to help him, to guide him, to instruct him, to deliver him. And I'm here to say to you this morning that there are angels in our midst. That if we are praying for each other, that there are angels that are here. And they're intervening. And the way that we actually pray and they actually interact with us is through the ladder. And the ladder represents Christ. And Christ loves us so much that despite the choice that we made to break the ladder, that Jesus has extended that ladder to us and is sending us anything and everything he can to save us. Who can you, who can you compare to this? I wish sometimes that God would do Jacob's ladder to me in my dreams to remind me that he is working for me. And he is working on my behalf, and he's intervening. But you know what the reality is, and I've shared with you already. I've challenged you to go home and write out 
a log of all the times in your life that you know that God has intervened. Maybe we don't need a dream because we can see the clear evidence in front of us. Maybe that was true for Jacob too, but he failed to see. And in this dream, I'm sure that he was empowered knowing that God was there for him. But you know what happened right after? We just read it. He wavered again. Did God give up? No, he didn't. Because God came to him again. God came to him again. Now, if you've got your Bibles there, go to Genesis chapter 32. God comes to him again. Genesis chapter 32, verse 20. 32, verse 20. And Jacob's here, and he's coming into the presence of Esau there, not quite yet. And he says to his servant, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he thought I may appease him with the present. He wants to send a present ahead of him. And afterwards I shall see his face, perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night in the camp. If you go down just a little bit further, you find out God again intervenes in his life. In verse 24 of chapter 32, and Jacob was left alone there in verse 24. And a man wrestled with him until when? Till daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now let me tell you something. If this angel wanted to get into this kind of a wrestling match with man, how long would it last? Okay? What's going on here? There's a lesson, isn't there? The angel is doing this for a reason. Jacob certainly didn't think that, hey, I'm pretty strong, I'm pretty powerful. Verse 26 says, And he said, Let me go, says the angel, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said what? I will not let go until you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans, and have what? Prevailed. Was he talking about the prevailing of his muscle with the angel? No. It was what? It was the spiritual battle that was going on inside of himself. He remembers the latter. He remembers the fact that it is God that gives him the ability to move forward. Does he have problems after this? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He's afraid of his brother. His brother has all of these men that are being sent out. So he decides to split his people in half. So if, if Esau hits the one, at least he'll have the other. I mean, in God's mind, he's like, what do I got to do? And it's no different than you and I. Here he's trying to teach Jacob a lesson. Hosea is trying to teach the people a lesson that despite all the things that have happened, if they would only trust in God. And that continues to be a problem with us today. The latter represents Jesus, the appointed medium of communication. Had he not with his own merits, bridged the gulf that sin had made, ministering angels could have had no communion with fallen man. Christ connects man in his weakness and his helplessness with the source of infinite power. It's not about us. It's about him. Because every time that I look at myself, the law shows me a reflection of myself. And my weakness and my inability will never win. And the devil makes us think we can win, and then he turns it around and says, you know what? You can never win. When we stand before God, what does Satan do? He points out our weaknesses. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, read or, or heard or been a part of exorcisms, 
But oftentimes when you go and you're dealing with an exorcism, the person who is filled with a demon will say to the person who's coming in to do the exorcism, what right do you have to call me out? You were just doing this this morning. But you know what your response should be? It's not about me. I'm not the one that's casting you out. It's Jesus that's doing that work. And in yours and my life, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how difficult it gets, no matter how much the wrestling match happens, the overcoming is not you and me. And that's a real issue in our world today. It's an issue in our church. That it's somehow that it's something that I'm doing. And it's not about me. It's about surrendering, dying to me, so that God can do miraculous things. We need Jesus, friends. And you know what you find here in this scenario? You find humiliation, don't you? But you know what? Sometimes we need humble. Sometimes we do. Maybe more often in some of us than others. I know that I ask for humbleness every day. Through humiliation, through repentance, through self-surrender, that's what gives us victory. That's what allows us to prevail. It's because we're putting our trust in the majesty of heaven. Listen to this. As Jacob was threatened with death by his angry brother, so the people of God will be in peril from the wicked who are seeking to destroy them. And as the patriarch wrestled all night for deliverance from the hand of Esau, so the righteous will cry to God day and night for deliverance from their enemies that surround them. Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and to break his hold upon God. He does that because he knows that that life source, that grip of relentless grace, is what Satan is seeking to disrupt. And we must choose to hang on. Such will be the experience of God's people in the final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test our faith, our perseverance, our confidence in his power to deliver us. Satan will endeavor to terrify us with the thought that our cases are hopeless, that our sins are too great to receive pardon. And the reality is we stand before God filthy, my friends. You understand this. We do not stand before God perfect. We stand before him filthy rags. It is the advocate. There is an adversary that wants to point out our sin. But it's the advocate that says, no, I died for him. I died for her. They're mine. They're no longer orphans. They're my children. And because of my life connection with Jesus, that I have the right to go to the kingdom of heaven. It says that they will have a deep sense of their shortcomings. As they review their lives, their, their hopes will sink. But remembering the greatness of God's mercy and their own sincere repentance, they will plead his promises made through Christ to helpless, repenting sinners. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. They will lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel. And the language of their souls will be, I will not let go thee except thou bless me. My prayer for each of us today is that we don't let go. The reality is Jesus will never let go. The reality for you and I is the only way that you and I will miss out on walking through those gates is because we let go. I want to show you this short video clip. I don't know if you've seen this before or not. But it is a powerful, powerful clip. Yes, go ahead.
He wants to finish the race. This is his father. Watch the expression on his face as his father helps him. time I see that I just get teared up when I recognize that that is our Heavenly Father for you and I. Paul says that we're running a race. We see the goal in mind but sometimes the devil comes after us and causes us to have all kinds of problems. And the thing is we can sometimes look at ourselves and become overwhelmed and feel like you know what I just can't. But we have a Heavenly Father that says no I'm, I'm right there. I'm right beside you. And at times we can see in our lives that the Lord carried us through. I am so grateful for our Heavenly Father. And I hope that in your lives, each and every day, that you never forget how great God is. That you will wrestle every day. And you will say, like Jacob, I won't let go. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for what you have done, what you are doing, what you have planned for our future. Lord, we don't want to turn one way or the other. We want to stay on the path that you have shown us. Lord, we know that you will never let go. You will pull us like Peter from waters that are enveloping around us and make us feel as if we're hopeless and helpless. But you will pull us from those. Lord, I ask that in each of our lives that we will grow in our knowledge of you. So many that Hosea was talking to had lost the knowledge of you. They had forgotten how important and how central you are in their lives. And the reality is, Lord, we are no different today than they were back in the book of Genesis or Hosea. Lord, we need you. Times are going to get tougher. Because the devil knows his time is short, we need you more than ever. I ask on behalf of each one here, Lord, that you would intervene in any of our lives that need intervening, if not all, so that we can see you, that we can behold you, as the prayer this morning was, by beholding we become changed. Be with us this day, Lord. Again, we love you so, so very much. Be with us now as we, we sing this closing song. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Jesus, you are that ladder. We wish to climb you. We wish to dine with you. We wish to fellowship with you. We, let, we wish to live with you for all of eternity. Be with us now, Lord, again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.